the wording of the, 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 the law, the new law that was passed, um, I think, uh, four days ago, is very, very wide. It captures, I mean, it's called anti-BDS. It's not just BDS. It's much more than BDS. I mean, if, um, if I understand correctly what BDS is. It basically says <coughs> that the, minist the Minister of Interior, who was empowered already today um, to prevent entry, to deny entry to people who um, advocate BDS. Now the law says the opposite, that the Minister of Defense should, um, would de deny, it, it is instructed to deny entry of people who publicly call for boycott or commit themselves, pu publicly commit them, committed themselves to participate in boycott. So not only calling for boycott, but also uh, boycotting, being a boycotter, which is a, which is a, which is a big difference. Because if I call on others to boycott, that's one thing. But if I just sign that I boycott, that's a completely different thing. And the, we have a 2011 uh, law, the, 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 the original anti-boycott law, which made it a civil wrong um, to call publicly for boycott. And um, uh, people or uh, businesses who uh, allege that, the, the, if, that my call for boycott has caused them damage could sue me for calling for boycott. I mean, if I call to boycott a cheese because it's too expensive, then I'm protected. But if I call to boycott uh, the, uh, uh, a settlement uh, produ uh, producer because, um, because he violates uh, Palestinian rights, then I am subject to, um, to civil uh, tort uh, suits. Now, the new, but, but the old anti-boycott law did not target the act of boycott, just the calling for boycott. This bill deals both with calling for boycott and engaging in boycott. And the boycott is not only a boycott on Israel. And this is another important thing. Um, the, the boycott is defined as any, um, any um, um, boycott or academic, economic, or cultural boycott of a, of a person or an entity due to its uh, affiliation to the state of Israel or lands that, it, uh, that is under its control. So, yeah. I, I, if my question was more in practical terms, what kind of intelligence yeah, uh, operation is backing this. Are okay. they, are, are so they going to Google people who okay, come in? I understand. I, I, I said all that because I wanted you to know that um, that uh, you, Meretz USA or APN, Americans for Peace Now, and probably some of J Street uh, uh, activists are captured by this law. So you have all this spectrum for from moderate uh, Zionist. Uh, Jews to um, um, radical anti-Israelis, if there are such things. Now, how it will be applied in practice is still to be seen. I, I presume that um, the um, Ministry of Interior will have to uh, create some guidelines for the, uh, um, for the uh, border control. And those guidelines, um, once, it, once, once that well, they will be formed, will uh, allow us to understand which of the, or, or, where on the spectrum between having a blacklist that is being um, assembled uh, and, um, uh, and uh, intelligence is gathered from all possible lists uh, that are on cyberspace. I don't know how they will connect names with passport numbers and things like that, but you know, if Israel wants to do that, it, it probably can. Uh, and the more, um, the more, uh, the other extreme, which is what the uh, Ministry of Interior spokesperson have said that is the case, and I'm not sure why. In a minute, I'll tell you why I don't think it's the the case. 
Um, the other extreme is only famous boycotters and, uh, and, and, and known activists. Okay? Now, why I'm not sure that, that this is the case? The reason is that this is not a law that was initiated by uh, the civil service. It's not something that came from, from, from the ground, so to speak, from, from the um, governmental ministries, um, a, an, initi a, an initiative that has to do with some problems that they have been facing, but rather it came from the, uh, as, a, as a political stunt by the Jewish home. And now it, in, it is imposed on the Minister of Interior who has to figure out what to do. So it's really not clear what they will do. If, as a lawyer, I tell all of you, if you are signed to uh, boycotting settlement produce, let's say that you, that, that you also sign that you will buy only Israeli produ produce every day, but settlement produce you will not, then you are captured by that law, in, in, in theory. So how it will be played out in practice, I don't know. I urge you all to read. There is a good piece today in Haaretz yeah. on, on how the anti-BDS uh, uh, academics here in America say, well, we, we, there's, uh, we don't know what to do now because we're also being uh, uh, labeled as BDS because BDS in Israel, as I said, is a demon. So it has... It, it, is, it is inflated much more than what really BDS is. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, when we, when we act in history, sometimes we, we're, we have to live these contradictions, and perhaps you as a human rights activist have to, have, you must, I'm not criticizing, yeah. but you must live a, contra a certain contradiction. So the contradiction being, you as a lawyer, and you, you mentioned this, you legitimize the state and you legitimize a racist state that some of us believe shouldn't even exist. That is the state of Israel. And on the other hand, you're looking for a resistance movement that is going to uh, change the situation. And we can't just wait for it spontaneously. It's gonna, like, it's gonna just come. So my question then becomes, you as a, both a human rights lawyer and as an individual, how do you resolve this contradiction of legitimizing a racist state? And on the other hand, uh, what do you contribute to the resistance of Palestinians and Israel? So first, for, first I have to say, I do believe in the right of Israel to exist. I disagree with you on that. Uh, I hope Israel uh, will exist and will be a democratic state um, that does not engage in occupation of uh, other people. Um, I do agree that by um, doing the work I do, there is a price that I pay uh, as an anti-occupation uh, activist in the form of legitimization to the authorities uh, and sometimes to the narrative that I have to be involved in. When I go to court, I want to win. And if I want to win, I, you know, if I will use your language, I will be in probably between 20 and 30 seconds uh, uh, be thrown out of court. I have to engage in the narrative. Um, you know, I, I try to push the envelope as much as I can, but I have to, uh, uh, to do that. Um, I think there are several answers to, your, to, 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 to the um, charge that by doing that, we legitimize the system. First, legitimization is um, the the, the, the um, amount of legitimization changes from time to time, and it depends very much on the prestige of the authorities involved. I think that in the 80s, for example, for those who know a little, a little of the history of the Israeli court, the Israeli court in, uh, enjoyed a lot of prestige in the international community, definitely in Israel, as an activist, liberal, uh, even progressive court. And so losing in such a court is a, big, is a big failure because it not only means that you didn't get the remedy you sought for, but also it means that you crystallized the status quo. And because court decisions do not only bind, but they also educate the public. 
I do not think this is the case today. I think the Israeli court has suffered from a, uh, for a massive deterioration in its uh, uh, reputation, uh, probably to a large extent because of its occupation jurisprudence. Uh, and I think that today losing in the Israeli court is a, uh, a, bears a much um, lower price of legitimization. Second, I think part of, of the reason why human rights lawyers legitimize the system is because people look at, the, at those human rights lawyers and they say, if they go to that system, that means they think that system is fair, that system has some uh, 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 guarantees against, arbitra uh, uh, against um, arbitrariness and, and some form of, of um, 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 respect to, to basic notions of uh, civil rights. But I think that much of that price can be uh, saved if I make these speeches. <laughs> if I write that I don't think so, that I explain that I go there because I don't have any other choice, and I criticize uh, the judges and the court and its role in making the occupation work. And I know that many people do not read or listen to what I say, and still there will be this thing that the Israeli human rights community goes to court. And yet, this is something that has to be leveled with the olive groves, the family unification, and all the other, the, 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 all the other stuff. <laughs> yes, I'll do that. Yeah. Given that the two-state solution seems more and more impossible because of Israel's intransigence, um, how do you understand what a d one state or a democratic state, you said a democratic Jewish state, what would that even mean, a democratic Jewish state, when you have all these Palestinians? How do you understand what that could possibly be? So while I do believe in the uh, right of Israel to exist, I do not believe that countries have a religion, or a, um, and I don't believe that Israel it should be a Jewish or a Christian or a Muslim state. It should be a democratic state, but also the homeland for Jewish people and where they can ex exercise their right to self-determination and culture and so on. Um, the, the question of one state, two states is a very big question. As a human rights activist, I welcome any um, solution that provides maximum uh, protection to human rights of all people that live in the area. As a political um, um, being, uh, I'm involved in a, in a group that is called uh, One Homeland, Two States, which, um, which thinks of a, of a solution that is uh, more, that has the element of two states, but also a federative element in it. Uh, and we believe that although one state is a moral, perfectly moral, solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We believe that, realistically, one state would, we would be, there is a danger of balkanizing the area if we compel a one state on two nations that both, um, unfortunately, did not um, lose hope to have um, a political self-determination. Neither the Palestinians nor the Israeli Jews have forsaken the idea of having a nation state. So in, these, in, this, in this state of affairs, we in the One Homeland, Two States initiative believe that two states that are with open borders and that have some kind of a federative element, which means that um, all uh, residents from the Jordan River to the, to the sea will have a citizenship in one of those states and a residency in all of the land uh, and would have the possibility of residing and working anywhere in this territory with some um, shared institutions, mainly when it comes to economy and welfare, uh, that would allow some kind of balance uh, uh, and equality in, in economic, uh, economical, uh, economical uh, equality between the two um, communities. This is what we believe uh, eventually should uh, happen. But to be fair, to be fair, the idea of 
uh, of federation is something that becomes more and more a topic of discussion in Israel. And this initiative, I may, I, I, I'm joking, it's not 50 people, it's really much more. We're doing grassroots work. There are 50 or 60 people that are at the center of it. There's an Israeli group and there's a Palestinian group. There are two groups, one movement, one homeland, two states. And we work very hard to create some kind of a, I'll call it a shelf product, something. When someone would be serious, we have a, an idea. Yeah, um, the, the film, The Settlers, I encourage all of you to, um, to see it. It's a, it's a really powerful film um, made by um, um, Shimon Dotan. He's a famous Israeli director that lives in the last three decades in New York and teaches at NYU. Uh, and he has uh, created a, a, a documentary of more than two hours that is dedicated to the phenomena of the settlers and settlements. And uh, uh, this film has much more um, impact outside Israel than in Israel. In Israel, it was screened, but you know, mainly in Tel Aviv. It was also aired uh, on television, but not on prime time uh, national uh, channels. Um, I think it was mainly made for the international audience, but it's also in interesting for uh, the Israeli audience. These kind of th films are very important, and they do create some kind of um, uh, stir in Israel because, you know, the joke is that uh, uh, um, foreign news in Israel is what do they say about us, um, and 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 that is a big thing. I mean. You have these, these uh, uh, um, reports constantly in Israel about things that happen outside Israel, mainly in Western Europe and, and America, which have to do with how people see us. And so when these kind of documentaries, these kind of films uh, are um, successful, when Five Broken Cameras became a candidate for the Oscars uh, as best documentary, um, um, these things do have an impact. Look, there is one thing I haven't said. Israelis, most Israelis, not all of them, but Israelis do think of themselves as people of the world, not as a uh, secluded uh, you know, island um, and that don't need anyone else. Israelis want to have weekends in Paris and do business with American companies, and they see themselves as as people of this globalizing world. So by, by putting a mirror to, to, to the Israeli society and saying, well, you know, it's more and more difficult to say that you're Israeli abroad, that has an impact. What is the impact? We cannot measure that, you know, today. It, it, it's something that accumulates. So for those of you who don't know, this is Dorothy Zellner. <laughs> and I met Dorothy, I think, 10 years ago, maybe even more. And since then, once a year, I get a, a, an email or a phone call saying, we are arriving, and usually it's at 2 o'clock in the morning, so be aware if we'll be stopped, we need you in the, in the border. Um, the groups in Israel need, I don't know what to, adverb to use, um, need extremely the support from, uh, uh, from outside. Um, and there are, there are different layers to the support that, that Israeli groups like Breaking the Silence, who I am the legal advisor of, and probably is the most attacked, targeted group in Israel today. Um, they need it because this is their only lifeline they have. It's the only, um, the, only, um, the only thing that stops or slows the authorities from closing them up is the, the intuition that there might be a huge uh, upro out outroar in uh, European capitals, in America, in Jewish communities, very important. And that would end up like the Human Rights Watch fiasco, 
with the government having to back down and allow a person to get in two hours after the law that bans all of us from going to Israel, not me because I'm a, I have an Israeli passport, uh, uh, allows him to, to, to go in, the uh, Human Rights Watch uh, researcher. So having um, this kind of a very public support by uh, groups here, and that support can come in many forms. It can come in uh, hosting delegates when they come here. It may come in visiting us in Israel, in Palestine, when, uh, where we do the work, uh, in interviews, of course, in donations. Everything that shows those who look to see if we are weaker than yesterday, that no, we are stronger and we have the support of many groups. And if you will do something really bad to us, you will have to deal with all of those groups. This is the only, um, po the only um, um, life boat that we have. Uh, because it seems that the government has um, completely abandoned every uh, principle, moral principle, and the only thing that is left are utilitarian uh, considerations. Is that an answer? Yeah. Oh, I, I think that these groups are very important. They're very important because there is still work to be done, of course, inside, and the Israeli public is not, you know, vested for life with the ultra-right, absolutely. And also I think that the fact that you have constant uh, dissent voices from within is very important to show that, you know, the, the Israeli occupation is not an internal Israeli affair, so uh, um, the international community is obligated to deal with it, but it's easier for um, different actors to demand things from Israel when voices in Israel itself demand the same thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm a Guantanamo defense attorney, and much of what's Guantanamo is built upon seems to be taken from the template of Israeli occupation law. I won't go into detail, but it's also been imported already into U.S. domestic law, and we're calling it U.S. domestic common law war. And it really is a form of martial law or, or occupation law. And so I guess I just want to throw out uh, two things. One is everything that's happening in occupied territory does have a effect here in the United States, I believe, in what's happening domestically as far as their own legal regime. And the other thing is a quick question regarding uh, individual Palestinians who are accused of a, a hostile act. And, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but that could include just something like writing graffiti on the wall or, yeah. you know, and get them into military detention. Um, yeah. A lot of things, I mean, America has to pay a lot of royalties to Israel. Um, there is, um, even in the torture case, um, I understand that I, I read about it a lot, and I understand that uh, some of the practices that were um, used in Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib were taken from uh, the Israeli portfolio uh, of the past. Um, uh, Israel has, was the first to engage in a targeted killing um, of, you know, openly admitted targeted killing policy. And uh, when it has, the American administration was fiercely uh, objecting to it, saying it's illegal under international law. I was litigating the, ca the case back in 2002, 2006. And later on, America um, copycatted the, this policy. So, yes. Um, I feel that many times uh, the Israeli practice, practices in the West Bank are a kind of a laboratory for, um, for, uh, ac for practices that other nations, uh, and mainly America, uh, is applying to uh, in its own um, conflicts. Uh, and in that sense, I think um, that if not for anything else, um, this is another reason why uh, the Israeli occupation uh, must end. Um, your other question was about, remind me, um, oh, yes. ah, about the, the, the uh, uh, criminal, um, the, the military criminal Correct. law. The Israeli, the, the Israeli uh, military uh, criminal law that applies to Palestinians in the West Bank and in previous times in, in Gaza uh, is, is, a, is, a, is a very authoritarian 
um, um, kind of, of, of law. And it um, criminalizes every act um, that is uh, seen as <coughs> supporting, <coughs> sorry, supporting illegal organizations. Almost every Palestinian organization that objects uh, and acts against the occupation was declared at some point as uh, unlawful association. So if you write a graffiti saying, um, you know, end to the occupation, long live Fatah, then you have materially aided uh, and supported uh, terrorism. And absolutely, you may be tried for several years in prison for that. And people have been tried for years just for membership in, in, in an unlawful association, even what we call, we, even the uh, military courts call it a theoretical membership, meaning you've never done anything. You met someone in a cafe, he said, would you join the Laksa Brigade? You said, yeah, fine. You're a member. You can get to three, four years in prison for that. So, but that's just one example of so many. I mean, every three, uh, every 10 people who want to gather in a corner of a street need a permit from the military commander, no matter why they gather there. It doesn't have to be a demonstration. Um, the law allows the, the, the army many, many tools to, to fight any kind of what is seen by it as a subversive activity, which means any, pro any resistance to the occupation, violent or not. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to make two points or discuss what you just mentioned. It seems to me your support of a federated state is a rationalization for the colonial settlement of other people's land. That there is no recognition of the right of the people of Palestine to return to their own land. The second point I want to make is you talked about a rich Jewish culture in a separate and a federated state. Why cannot there be a rich Jewish culture in a single state where everybody has one legal right to be equal? Can, but they don't want. So that's basically, I, look, I, I believe in human rights. And when I believe in human rights, that means I take seriously what people say their well-being entails. Of course, if it comes on the expense of other people, we have a problem. But if you ask, how do the Jewish people want to express their uh, self-determination, they could say, we want to be in Brooklyn and have a beautiful Jewish cultural life. And some of them have, but others didn't, and they think they want something else. You have to respect that. The problem is your first question. Right, so let's put the second question aside and deal with the first question. You haven't heard what I think about the right of return, and what do I think about how refugees, uh, passing refugees, should be um, compensated or uh, redressed. And this is a very, very... Uh, important, crucial question, and probably this is the heart of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But in order to address that, one has also to acknowledge that there are six million people that live in Israel, and they're not going anywhere, not to the sea, and not to Europe, and not anywhere. So now we have to see how we accommodate all of that. The, the legitimate rights of the, the 1948 refugees to have, to have a redress for their loss and the fact that fifth or sixth generation of people live already in uh, Israel. And just like the many, many people who live in America on lands that once belonged to another nation. This is something that happens in many, many places. Israel is not the first one. So one of the reasons I want to end the occupation so fast is that I don't want us to get to a point where the settlers have six generation of children and I would be it would be difficult to me for me to say they have to go away that's the only place they they know that's where they were born that's where their parents were born that's where th they were raised so international um, international um, post-conflict arrangements have been evolved in the world we don't have to uh, invent the wheel, um, and there are different types of mechanisms for redress. Not always 
redress is in the form of getting back everything as it was before, even if that causes a new wrong to people who are not themselves to be blamed for what happened um, three or four generations ago. So I think that the issue of the Palestinian uh, refugees has to be dealt with. It's, the, it's holding the bull by its horns. It has to be dealt with in there are many, and, and, and this is something that we are, you know, no one in Israel deals with, but our, our group, uh, One Homeland, Two States, does deal with that and tries to find out how many people can actually go back to where they lived, their parents and grandparents lived, without um, creating a new wrong, without evacuating people from their houses. There are places that communities can go back to. There are communities who could not go back to, and they would have to be somehow uh, um, uh, compensated. But they all could get a Palestinian citizenship and reside everywhere they want between the Jordan River and the sea if the state of Palestine decides to allow them citizenship. Of course, this is their business. Yeah. Uh, just a question. Is there a clamor among Palestinians for their own separate state? Is, well, uh, all, all polls in, in, in the Palestinian uh, society show that uh, there is a big uh, um, support for the two-state solution, even today. But there is a growing number of people that say they want one state. And I think that this voice um, is, not, is not coming from a place of this is what we want, but we do not believe that two states is actually possible. And also, <coughs> one must remember that uh, this was the ideology uh, of the PLO before uh, Oslo, uh, before uh, 1988, um, that uh, a one secular state. Many things have changed in the Palestinian society as well since then. Yeah. Um, yeah well, um, I was a professional. I'm a member of uh, JVP, and much to their consternation, I'm also a communist. Um, <laughs> I can deal with anything. <laughs> so, I mean, one thing we always say to our young comrades is, you're not going to find a job that allows you to change the system, right? But we still, when we get in trouble, we need to have a good lawyer or a good doctor. But, and a job is how you organize, you know, meet people to organize. But it's certainly, you know, if you want to change the system, you have to build a movement. But um, the other thing I would say is that I think when capitalism gets in a lot of trouble, like it is in the United States, it's no longer the primary economic, military, political ruler of the world. And there's, it can't provide a good living to people as is also true in Israel, inevitably it's going to end up um, in a very fascist society. And uh, whether we're going to go there rapidly with Trump or have bumps along the road and get there more slowly, I think it's more evident that you know capitalism is going to kill us by international war, by nuclear war, by climate change, by epidemics. I don't know which is going to come first. But um, you know, we have to think about changing the whole system. And I think that's true here. And I think when you talk about Israel-Palestine, it's less a matter of one state or two states or what kind of economic system you have. Because the fact of the matter is that even Palestine, occupied as it is, is a tremendously inegalitarian, capitalist, unfair state with an inequality index equal to that of Israel and the United States. So I think you know, we really need to think in even broader <laughs> terms of change, although I admire yours. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'll add the fourth purpose plane of changing the system. Um, and I, I, just, I just want to say that the issue, the economic issue is, is, is a major issue uh, in the conflict as well. And the, it's not only that the communities, both the Palestinians and the Israelis, are um, traumatized by uh, inequality in them, but also the massive uh, uh, difference in GDP of, bo of two, the two communities make it very difficult to, to have some kind of a um, um, sustainable solution of two states side by side when one is third world income and the other is first world income. So this is why in our federal uh, um, uh, initiative, we also uh, injected some uh, economic 
uh, um, issues that or ideas to make somehow the uh, uh, inequality between the two communities smaller. Yeah. In uh, January, you, you went back to Israel to speak before the Supreme Court about the issues with Amona. Could you update us on uh, what the status is of the removal of the settlers? And I understand they would be removed to other Palestinian lands. <laughs> Amona is, a, is an, an outpost, what we in Israel call an outpost, what the, should be called uh, another uh, settlement, but uh, uh, unauthorized, at least officially, by the state. Amona was, cre uh, was uh, created, uh, erected in 1998 uh, on private registered Palestinian land. And since then, the uh, owners of, uh, of the land have been uh, fighting to get their lands back and uh, remove the trespassers. In 2005, I filed a petition um, to, uh, demo to demolish nine uh, big villas that were being built at that day in Amona. And um, that was the first Amona um, uh, demolition that uh, took place in uh, February 1st of 2006, where settlers and the um, security forces clashed uh, severely. Then in 2008, we filed the petition to um, dismantle the whole of Amona, which means uh, 45 families um, that lived in uh, movable caravans um, and uh, inhabited the whole, it's a, it's a big hill. Um, and uh, we won in 2014, December of 2014, and the court gave the state two years, long time, um, to make the preparations for the removal of uh, Amona. Uh, what happened uh, at the end of uh, the deadline in December of 2016 was that the government has went into these deals with the Amona people and promised them um, to be moved to a nearby place adjacent to where the Amona is built at that time um, on uh, other plots of other people. <laughs> um, the way they did, they did that, they, they invented this idea that uh, people who are, it's not even invented, but there is, a, there is a classification or status of lands that is called abandoned lands, lands that the owner is not in the country. So abandoned land is being taken care of by the government. The gov government is a, a trustee, it doesn't become an owner. Uh, and they said, okay, if we are the trustee of these lands, there are like uh, 38 uh, parcels of land, so we decide that until the owners come back, and we will not allow them to come back, um, you can stay there, you can live there. So I went back to, to Israel, and uh, uh, we, together with my colleagues, first of all, we found 35 of the 38 um, owners, and they were not abroad, they were just there. <laughs> In, in the nearby village of Silwad, uh, and no one cared to let them know that their land is being uh, uh, designated abandoned. So 35 plots out of 38 were immediately, the, the designation as abandoned was canceled, and then they said, okay, we'll build the new Amona on the last three. So that would be the first, um, you know, Manhattan-like outpost uh, with caravan on caravan. Anyway, even that was not, we managed to, to uh, prevent even that. I would not get into how, but eventually they were removed and they would, did not get their, um, their uh, new outpost in the same area. And now, and they've been uh, um, promised to have a new settlement being built for them somewhere else. And um, and um, Netanyahu gave them in writing this promise, but then he met Trump, and Trump said no, and now the Jewish home is uh, boycotting some of the uh, Netanyahu's legislation on, on, um, that he's uh, uh, interested in, and there's a whole coalition crisis about it. <laughs> yeah. You earlier sort of derided international law. Right? I mean, not international law per se, but rather international forums. Right? The ICC can't really help. They're not going to send planes to decolonize the settlements. But you still got a master's in law in international human rights law, right? And you've been a part of, sort of um, I guess, some of the thinking behind third party actions and the ICC per se. And there have been some gains, right? There was, there was the, the Marmara case in which Spain. Um, convicted Israeli officials, I'm probably misremembering, after they found that like a Spanish citizen was injured 
right? So there's sometimes where international law does function. Do you see that as a game? And is that a reason to move away from the Israeli court? I do see that as something that is a major um, um, parameter. And um, these things come and go. Universal jurisdiction was a big thing, and then uh, it uh, basically collapsed with, uh, um, with um, amendments to laws in different uh, European countries. Um, but there are definitely a lot of um, um, legal actions that are taken around the world that are very important in, in, in uh, uh, creating this um, sense of uh, accountability. And um, especially, I am involved in, uh, in business and human rights cases around the world, where I, where I think is the next big thing of taking um, businesses to court for their involvement in, in the Israeli occupation in their home countries. Uh, and I'm involved in several of such uh, um, litigations in three or four different jurisdictions. So I definitely think that international law and um, cross-national litigation are extremely important and extremely helpful. I do not think that, I think that the, they complement rather than can replace internal lit litigation. Yeah. Mentioned about the, uh, you talked about the self-determination of the Jewish people, and and uh, uh, I'd like to ask you uh, the the uh, idea of the Jewish self-determination uh, still can can apply to the Jewish people outside of Israel uh, because. Uh, there are many uh, Jewish people who don't want to relate themselves to Israel state. Mm -hmm. And uh, also there is a, 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 ethnic, a ethnic, ethnic Japanese who converted to Jew, uh, Jews mm -hmm. and uh, who can, who can uh, em emigrate to Israel. So the idea of the uh, of general uh, Jewish self-determination is uh, very anormal and uh, problematic, I, I think. So uh, what your well, opinion? I, I mean, we're, we're returning to this question, and I see that it's something that, 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 con that many people are concerned about, and I understand that. But I, I, I refuse to ignore reality. I would be happy to um, live in a post-national world. We will all sing Imagine and be, and be one race. As long as it's not the case, as long as people do want, do identify themselves as part of groups and they want self-determination, political self-determination in the form of a state, I cannot ignore that. What would you tell the six million Jews that live in Israel? And they say, they say, we do not want any other form of self-determination. What we want is to be able to live in a country that is a, a, a home for Jewish people. Not only for Jewish people. It should not be the home only for Jewish people. And it should maintain it complete equality with other people, with, uh, with other citizens of the state. That, that, that's more, uh, this is a, a, an issue that I'm, that I'm struggling with much more than the question of uh, whether Israel can be um, a state uh, that is a home for the Jewish people and be democratic. Because I do agree that the law of return makes it a problem. I, um, uh, immigration law that is discriminatory is a problem. And I do believe that um, it could be justified uh, for a limited uh, time as, um, as a, um, a preferential treatment for people who were victims of uh, and, 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 and uh, refugees of discrimination and persecution. And I do agree that at a certain point there could not be a, um, um, a um, justification for it. Yes. First, I would like 
to say alf shukr that's arabic for a thousand thanks for the work you're doing and for being thank you the question is have you in your work as an activist have you reached out to palestinians inside israel in jordan and the rest of the arab world the question was, as, have I, as a, an activist, reached out for um, Palestinians in Israel, in Jordan, and the rest of the Arab world? In Israel, of course, we work together a lot. Uh, and um, uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, citizens are a uh, com major um, uh, member in the Israeli human rights community. And... Um, so there, I mean, they have, um, there are NGOs that are dedicated to advancing uh, equality of the, uh, and, and, and the rights of the Arab uh, minority in Israel. And, um, and I work a lot, of course, with, and, and not just me, but the activist world in Israel is uh, involved, uh, is a Jewish Arab activist world. It's not a big one, but, the, but to the extent that it is, it's a Jewish-Arab uh, um, world. Um, as for uh, Palestinians in other countries, I'm afraid not. I'm afraid that uh, our possibilities of um, collaboration with, um, with Palestinians in Jordan, in Lebanon, and in other places is very, very limited. We meet them in conferences uh, in Europe. Uh, but we can't really uh, meet in the region uh, because of the political situation, sometimes um, because um, the laws of their countries forbid them from uh, being in, in, in touch with Israelis, like in Lebanon, and sometimes because um, there is no way to, co to actually collaborate in, on the ground. There are some initiatives um, that are very interesting uh, maybe you heard of Zohrot, which is a very important uh, NGO that I was the legal advisor of when it, uh, when it was just formed. Zohrot had uh, an interesting um, uh, relationship with Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. Um, and they created, um, they interviewed them, I think, um, through, um, through the internet. Um, in order to depict the uh, villages where they lived in, and they provided them with photo photos of their homes and things like that. So there is here and there some, um, some um, uh, communications, but much less than there should be. Thank you very much.